Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello, and welcome to The Authority, where today we'll be looking at the author of the Beowulf poem. In other words, the Beowulf poet. And that's the first mystery we'll be dealing with here. Who was the Beowulf poet? And obviously, when we're going further back in time, so when we're looking at Homer, not much is known about the, the great Greek poet Homer. Not much is known about the, 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 the Beowulf poet either. We don't know who wrote this great um, uh, epic of Anglo-Saxon England. Um, we know he almost certainly had to be a monk um, because the only people doing any writing at that time were monks. Um, so probably a Benedictine monk. Um but beyond that, we don't know anything else, except most people seem to think that he was writing about the same time as St. Bede, and we'll get to St. Bede, uh, the Venerable, fairly soon. In other words, we, we, we can date it around the early 8th century. Um, but before, as we don't know too much about the Beowulf poet, and we do want to try to see these works as far as possible, from the perspective of the author, obviously that's difficult. We don't, don't, don't know much about the author, but we can see something of the way the author would have seen the work by knowing something of the culture in which he lived. So we're going to begin uh, by looking at what was Anglo-Saxon England, and um, first of all, Anglo-Saxon England is the England that existed uh, between be before. Um, uh, the Norman Conquest in 1066, and after the uh, the leaving of the Romans uh, from England in the fifth century, the middle middle of the fifth century. So it's a period from about the 450s through to 10, 1066. So a period of about 600 years. And uh, now the, the the vast bulk of that time, Anglo-Saxon was a profoundly Catholic country. Uh, it was certainly by the time that the Beowulf poet is writing, it's profoundly Catholic. So basically. England, what we now call England, that wasn't even called England in those days, became largely Christian uh, during the Roman occupation. So the Romans came to England only about 20 years or so after the crucifixion. Uh, and the first English missionaries, uh, according to tradition, arrived at 63 AD, so only about 30 years after the crucifixion, uh, and established the first chapel. It was a chapel to the, the Blessed Virgin in Glastonbury in Somerset in southwest England uh, during the first century. Uh, the, certainly the chapel at Glastonbury was considered to be ancient by the third century. So this, is, this all sounds reasonable. We know that the, 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 the Catholic faith was spread by, uh, by missionaries with the empire. As the empire spread, the, the Christianity spread with it. So when the empire crossed over into England, Christianity crossed over with it. So it's entirely uh, likely that the, the, the first Christian missionaries arrived within a, uh, uh, the first few years of the Romans arrival. So 63 AD is an absolutely realistic date. Um, by the time the Romans left, almost 400 years later, England was largely uh, a Christian country. Uh, their um, uh, the, 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 the empire had been Christian for, for some time by, the, by this point. So when the Roman soldiers left, obviously the inhabitants didn't leave. So, so Christianity is already established in England by the 5th century. What happens then is that the uh, Anglo-Saxon tribes start moving in from, from, from the Germanies. Uh, the Germanic-speaking tribes, and many of these were pagan because uh, evangelization hadn't reached those parts of Europe at this time. Um, and so it's often thought that the Anglo-Saxons, England became pagan. Now, that's an oversimplification because, I say, the English Christians that lived there presumably continued to live there. Also, the Saxon shore, as it was called, uh, around England, around the coast of England, the south coast and the east of coast of England, was largely uh, already populated by uh, Germanic tribes. That's why it's called the Saxon shore before the Romans left. 
So before the pagan Rome, uh, Saxons started moving in, and the and these many of these would presumably have been Christian. So we already have uh, this sort of mix mixture of this the new paganism coming in and the old Christianity. Uh, but definitively, when Saint, when Saint Augustine of Canterbury uh, comes over to the country at the end of the sixth century, um, that's when the, the pagan Saxons are evangelized and become Catholic Christians. By the time that the Beowulf poet is writing, um, uh, say we don't know for certain, but 150 or so years later, um, that um, England is profoundly Catholic. There are so many saints, in fact, in Anglo-Saxon England, we couldn't even really begin to start listing them. The first English poetry, in other words, the first poetry written in Old English, which was the, langu the Germanic language that was spoken in, in England at the time, was written by a monk called Cademon, and he uh, um, uh, wrote a very famous hymn uh, to creation in praise of God for, for creation itself. Uh, and I think that poem is actually referenced at the beginning of Beowulf, as we shall see fairly soon. Now, if it's correct that, 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 that the... Um, the Beowulf poet is a contemporary of Bede, so just shortly after Cademan, uh, and the fact that the poet's the poem, the Cademan's poem might be referenced in the poet in Beowulf would suggest that. Then uh, we know that Saint Bede um, was where he writes his ecclesiastical history of England. So we have a history of the Catholic presence in England going back to the earliest Roman times, being written at the time that the Beowulf. Uh, poem is being written so this is a, a, a golden age of catholicism it's also the age not just of saint Bede, this great scholar but of saint boniface the the anglo-saxon monk who goes across and um evangelizes the germanic uh pagan tribes of of, of germany saint boniface is, is the patron saint of germany for, for for being the one who converted the germans he was an anglo-saxon so this profoundly catholic time is when the poem is being written by a monk that should really automatically tell us all we need to know, if you like, about where the author of the Beowulf poem is coming from. He's an uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon monk writing a profoundly, uh, from a profoundly Christian perspective. One thing we know from Bede's Ecclesiastical History of England is Bede's uh, preoccupation with the heresy of Pelagianism. Now, Pelagianism is a heresy which be began in England of a British monk called Pelagius. That's what gives it its name. Uh, and it spread to other parts, but mostly it was a problem in, in, in Britain and Ireland. And it was earlier, but, but the fact that, that it's such a prominent part of uh, Bede's narrative uh, would suggest that Pelagianism was still uh, rampant, was still widespread in England at the time that Beowulf is being written, at the time that Bede is writing. And that's interesting because we will see that there's an aspect of the Beowulf poem uh, poem which is a rebuttal of the heresy of Pelagianism. Since that is so, it probably makes sense for us to say a few words about Pelagianism, because most of us are not uh, 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 scholars of church history and, uh, and, and, and of church doctrine and of heresy. But Pelagianism is actually one of the most widespread heresies that's still around today. It's changed its name, but it's the same thing. Pelagianism basically is what we would now call the self-help religion, that basically that we can improve ourselves and get to heaven or what we call heaven or what we think heaven is purely by our own efforts, by the triumph of our own will and by our own actions. We don't need outside help. It's about us. It's about self-empowerment. So if you go to Barnes & Noble, you, you know, you'll see shelves and shelves of, uh, of self-help books, probably more than you'll see Christian books. So this is a very powerful heresy, which, is, which show, has stood the test of time, and it's still around. We can do it ourselves. And what does Pelagianism mean, or self-help religion mean? It means that we don't need grace. Grace is the, uh, the, 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 uh, the word that theolo theolo theologians use for the supernatural assistance we need from God to enable us to cooperate with his power and to overcome the power of evil and our own fallenness and brokenness. We need grace. Well, if you're a Pelagian, we don't need grace. We do it ourselves. If we do it ourselves, we don't need grace. We don't need the sacraments. We don't need the sacraments. We don't need the church. It's just all about me. And uh, I listen to what Jesus says in the gospel, and I do it, and that's all I have to worry about.
So this, again, the fact that this heresy is rampant today shows that Beowulf, insofar as it's a rebuttal, uh, a repost, uh, an, an, an answer to the errors of Pelagianism, is very relevant today. Even if it's about fighting monsters in Anglo-Saxon England, the message it has is for today. And as we discussed last week in the authority with the authority of the Bible, we have to learn to read reality as well as reading Literal literature, not just literally, but literarily. We have to spot the signs uh, and what they signify, the allegories. So let's look at this then. Structurally, uh, the, the poem is uh, uh, made up of three consecutive struggles by Beowulf, this heroic Anglo-Saxon uh, leader, and three separate monsters. So first of all, he fights a monster called Grendel. And then he fights a monster called Grendel's mother. And then finally, in old age, he fights the final monster uh, and dies in the process of, of, of killing uh, the dragon, the third monster, the dragon. Now, this poem, like so much of literature, is prone to being misread by critics who misunderstand, uh, needing to see a work through the eyes of the author. We don't know who the Beowulf poet is, but we do know the profoundly Catholic culture that this monk was writing in. We should expect to find Christianity in there. But even you know, well-known, famous, reputable critics such as Harold Bloom get it woefully wrong. Now, Harold Bloom says that there's no reference to Christ in the poem, that there's no real reference to, uh, to Christianity insofar as there are any references to the Bible. It's all the Old Testament and it's all about fate and not providence. So where, where this, this basically what Harold Bloom is trying to do and wanting to do, because he's a Gnostic who does not like Christianity, is to explain the Christianity away or airbrush it out. So we're, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to show that it's there. And if you don't see it, it's because you're blind. So the first thing is uh, we have to understand that when the Anglo-Saxons use a word like weird or weird, W-Y-R-D, from which we get the modern word weird, W-E-I-R-D, um, they don't mean fate. The word is normally translated as fate, which is something fatalistic, right? It's all about luck or fortune. It's, there's, no, there's no providential design involved. That's not what the Christian Anglo-Saxons meant when they used the word weird. They did mean something which is profoundly providential, profoundly connected with God's presence in reality. And they, 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 they spoke about the web of weird, this idea that all of us, each of us as individuals is connected to every other individual in this sort of weird web, uh, weird woven web. So it's woven by the weirdness of God, right? God's providence. Um, and so the, 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 everything we do impacts everybody else in the web and everything else in the web of creation, the environment in which we live. Obviously, those closer to us get impacted more by the ramifications of what we do in the web. But there's a ripple effect that goes out and out beyond that. So we're all connected in this weird woven web. So when the word weird is used, it's meant in a providential Christian sense and not in a fatalistic pagan sense. So the first mistake is to translate the word weird as fate, because that leads to a misunderstanding of what the uh, the poem's about. Then we have the the engagement with the heresy of Pelagianism. So uh, Beowulf at the beginning of the poem, there's a great deal of time is, well, let's go back one, one step further before we even get to Beowulf. Grendel, this monster, is outraged through envy at the fact that this beautiful poem or hymn is being sung or recited you know, in the Mead Hall. Uh, and it's a hymn to God's creation and to the beauty of God's creation and to Genesis, the book of Genesis. And it's anger at the book of Genesis that causes Grendel to take to re wreak his vengeance on the people. And um, uh, we're told that he is a descendant of Cain, uh, but demonic descendant of Cain, as if, as if Cain's descendants are somehow uh, interbred with, with, with demonic, monstrous beings to make these monsters. So this, this is something which is a, a effectively demonic, uh, a worship of demonic forces, a, a, a hater of all that's good, true and beautiful, a uh, hater of God's creation. So that he's then killing and he's so powerful that no warriors can withstand Grendel. 
And then this mighty warrior arrives, Beowulf, and a great deal of time is spent on the fact that he's, he's more powerful, he's stronger than everybody else as a warrior and an athletic prowess. Uh, and in order to prove it, he says that he will, he will not use any weapons. He will fight Grendel just with his own uh, physical strength, with his, with his, his grip in wrestling, uh, uh, and he will not use any weapons whatsoever. Purely through the power of his own will, if you like, Pelagianism. And they fight, and Beowulf is superior. Beowulf does win. Beowulf rips off Grendel's arm, and Grendel goes off and dies. Beowulf is the hero of the moment, the hero of the hour, uh, is the hero of the people. But then Grendel's mother, uh, not surprisingly perhaps, is, is, uh, is angered by the fact that her son, uh, Grendel, has been killed and she starts uh terrorizing the people and killing the people and nobody can uh can um resist her destructive power so beowulf is called upon again this time however he doesn't say i'm going to do it using my own strength i'm he's going to he wears armor he also has this sword that's been wielded in battle successfully and and whoever's wielded this sword has won so Beowulf now is not, not just the mightiest human person who ever lived. He also has the best technology that human ingenuity can manufacture. This, this, this uh, mighty sword, which has never failed. And so armed, armored and strong, he faces Grendel's mother and he's powerless the sword doesn't work against Grendel's mother. His own strength doesn't work. He's doomed. He's going to die. He's, he can't do it through the strength of his own will. The Pelagian option doesn't work against this demonic power. And then as if by magic, we might want to use the word miracle, this sword appears. Uh, this sword, which is a gift, a supernatural gift. And on the sword, are a moment on the hilt of the sword, are illustrations of salvation history. So the, the whole connection with the Bible, uh, the covenant, the coming of Christ, it's on the hilt of the sword. And it's with this miraculous sword, which quite clearly represents grace, right? divine assistance, supernatural assistance against the power of evil. It's with this sword that Beowulf defeats Grendel's mother, not, that, not the man-made sword. And he makes it clear, he states explicitly, if it hadn't been for this gift, he would have lost quickly. So here we see the first, uh, the first two episodes of the poem illustrating the limits of human strength, human will, uh, that however strong it is, even if you're the strongest person in the world with the best technology that humanity can manufacture, you cannot defeat the power of evil. You need supernatural assistance, which is signified by the sword as representing grace. So this brings us to uh, the third um, part of the poem, the final part of the poem, um, which is when Beowulf meets the dragon. And again, Howard Bloom seems to miss what, are, to me, are very obvious uh, signs. You, once you learn to read literarily, so you have your antennae twitching, your allegorical antennae twitching, so you're looking for signs, you're looking for allegories. Uh, because that's the way you read literarily. It's the way you go deeper into the meaning of a work. Well, when as soon as we hear in the final part of the poem that Beowulf handpicks 12 warriors, right? He handpicks 12 warriors. Immediately, we should be thinking, okay, 12 people are chosen. And we, we should be thinking, okay, well, uh, let's see where, the, where this is going. One of the 12, the traitor raises the dra dragon's wrath by stealing treasure from the dragon's hoard. Uh, therefore, the dragon unleashes its fury on the people, forcing Beowulf, even though now he's an old man, to face the dragon uh, face, to, face to face in combat and fight to the death with the dragon. So when Beowulf goes to fight the dragon, of the 11 remaining hand-picked warriors apart from the traitor uh 10 run away and hide in the woods only one has the courage to stand by beowulf 
in his fight to the death with the dragon. When the dragon is destroyed, um, the other ten come skulking out of the woods. And Wiglaf, the, the, the one courageous one, obviously in the, the, the figure of St. John, uh, the divine, the one who stands behind, beside Christ uh, at the cross with, with, with the women, um, he, he, uh, he um, basically uh, rebukes them for their cowardice. Beowulf dies, but he dies victorious in the sense that the, pa- the dragon is vanquished. We then have uh, the final scene of the poem is of uh, a huge mound, burial mound. That was the way that the, the kings and other people were buried in, 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 in those times. A huge burial mound on a headland overlooking the sea, which would serve as like a lighthouse, as a sign to prevent ships from being uh, gate crashed, uh, from being, being, being crashing on the rocks. Uh and the last thing we see, this burial mound has been, been, been buried in memoriam, in memorial of Beowulf. There are twelve knights uh, in, going in a circle, galloping in a circle around the burial mound. Now think of that as an image, as a symbolic image. If if the memorial to Beowulf is is like the church, then the, uh, the galloping in a circle is like eternity. Right? It's not going to end. It's an endless circle uh going around revolving around the center which is the memorial to to, to Beowulf. uh and now is no longer 11 uh, the, the the judas figure the traitor has been replaced so the 12 apostles are about intact the 12 original bishops of the church so numerically just look at it now should we say algebraically that's the right word mathematically formulaically Beowulf. Hand picks 12. One of the 12 is a traitor who raises the wrath of the dragon, of the, of the, the demonic force. Um, uh, of the remaining 11, when Beowulf faces the dragon in mortal combat, 10 run away, leaving only one to stand, be, stand beside him out of the 12. And then at the end, uh, the, 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 the traitor has been replaced and there are 12 again. Um, clearly, this is an an, an analog, an analogy of the, the of the gospel story, particularly the Passion of Christ. And we we see the same thing uh, in other works of literature. And I'm going to allude to that now to to connect to make the connection, uh, the influence of Beowulf uh, on other works. So numerical signifiers or signifiers such as dates are, are ways in which um, medieval writers conveyed a Christian message. Uh, so we see, I'll discuss it when we get there, but in Seguin and the Green Knight, things happen at a certain time of the liturgical year to give deeper theological significance. Dante's Divine Comedy happens at a certain time of the liturgical year to give it deeper theological significance. Uh, the uh, the number of hens that, that, that Chanticleer has in the nun's priest tale uh, has a deep theological significance. Um, so, um, and we, we're going to discuss all this in future episodes of The Authority. Uh, the, um, but in other words, the technique here, the allegorical technique of uh, signif- signifying through the use of numbers or dates uh, is 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 common, and I'm going to end this discussion uh, of Beowulf with um, probably the, the the greatest expert on the poem, uh, arguably ever, um, certainly uh, in the 20th century, and that's uh, someone who will be known to many of us, that J.R.R. Tolkien. Now, Tolkien, of course, is known to many of us, most of us, as the author of the Lord of the Rings and of the Hobbit, and we will obviously see that definite similarities between uh the hobbit and beowulf right that someone steals from the dragon uh, the dragon's wrath is ra- is 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 raised in 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 consequence so they are clearly you know stealing from a dragon horde clearly similarities but in actual fact and again i'm not going to give the game away because we'll be doing the lord of the rings in a later episode that tolkien 
translated the Beowulf poem. He was an expert in Old English, he, he, the, the language of the Anglo-Saxons. He uh, translated the whole of the Beowulf poem. Uh, he gave uh, the seminal lecture on the poem uh, called The Monster and the Critics, which was published subsequently as, a, as an academic essay. Uh, which if you want to go deeper in the poem, then go there. And again, he, he does what I do. Uh, he, the monster and the critics, right? The critics get the monster wrong. Uh, as I've said, Harold Bloom gets the whole poem wrong. Um, so, but Tolkien in the Lord of the Rings uses the same, uh, technique that the Beowulf poet does to, to draw parallels between his story, which, uh, on a, on a literal level seems to have nothing whatsoever to do with the gospel, but by drawing these uh, analogies based upon dates and numbers, um, we can we can draw the connection of how there are parallels between the story and the gospel. Tolkien used the word applicability, that there are things in the story that are applicable beyond the story, both to our own lives and also to the gospel and obviously the way the gospel connects to our own lives. So here we see this masterpiece of Anglo-Saxon poetry, a uh, golden age of, of Catholicism in England, by a, written by a monk, a Benedictine, uh, that we see a refutation of heresies such as the self-help heresy of Pelagianism, and we see a reenactment, if you like, uh, or an, an analogous retelling of the story of the Passion of Christ in Beowulf's Fighting with the Dragon. So thanks as always for joining me. Next time we'll be going to an even greater poem uh, than, than Beowulf. In fact, arguably and probably the greatest poem ever written. Join me next time uh, in the authority as we turn to look at the great poet Dante and his divine comedy. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, Visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, Check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.